Talk to us now and go to the TNT Radio interactive live chat room at tntradio.live. Lighting the fuse for freedom. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Political commentator and investigative journalist. You're with Patrick Henningsen on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're now number two of this live broadcast, live and direct here on TNT. Today's News Talk. Very pleased you could join us for the second hour. Hello to everybody in the TNT chat community. We see the numbers building in there. That's where we want to be during the live broadcast, whether you're listening or you're watching the TNT chat community, which you can access in the red bubble in the lower right-hand part of the screen if you're at tntradio.live or if you're accessing via the app, which you can download on Google Play or the Apple Store. That's where you want to be during the live broadcast we've got a great community in there and we really appreciate you guys really now uh, i want to be uh changing gears here uh we're going to go back to uh international politics i want to welcome uh onto the stage very special guest uh from the russian federation who's going to be joining us yulia berg she is a political scientist also uh founder of the globus expert expert club she's joining us uh, right now on the live link yulia thank you for joining us on tnt this week Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. No, it's our pleasure as well. And this is uh, election season for the Russian Federation. There's a lot of uh, important uh, elections coming up. We're we're talking a lot, uh, especially this week, about the the, the new regions as as they're called in Russia, uh, with the elections coming up there. I want to get your comments on that, just in general, the situation um, in in the Donbass and in some of these parts of uh, what these new parts of the Russian Federation. Obviously, this is a, I'll caveat this for Western, some Western audiences, this will be a very controversial uh, uh, subject because uh, many in the United States will regard these as Ukraine still, uh, even after everything that's happened over the last two years. So that said, um, uh, I want to just get your thoughts on on the upcoming election how significant is this for the russian federation and also your experience past uh previously with um election monitoring um in this region as well we spoke to uh sonia uh van den Ende, uh just before in the previous hour she had a lot to share on this subject but i'm sure you do as well but uh, go ahead Yulia. Um, well, you know, my first, uh, my first uh, job uh, and my first uh, professional experience was related to the elections, and that was back in 2006. So I could talk about this uh, probably forever. <laughs> let me just make some, uh, let me just make several uh, clear points, and then if there are additional questions, we could dive deeper into those. But what's important to understand is that uh, in the Russian Federation, the electoral system, as well uh, um, as it is. Um, has been evolving for around 30 years, and it has been evolving under a great pressure, both from the inside, which is the internal opposition, and various kinds of um, electoral monitoring um, organizations. Um, and also from the, um, uh, it was um, evolving because of the external pressure, because every time Russia would have um, elections organized, there would always be a lot of criticism, mostly coming from the West. So that's why the electoral system and all of the procedures in the country uh, have reached a level at which um, there is an, not too many uh, electoral um, systems that you can compare it with because it's highly uh, digitalized. They have been testing uh, online voting uh, and various kinds of equipment uh, used for uh, polling stations. Uh, the procedures have become so transparent. So, for instance, in Russian Federation, since, if I'm not mistaken, 2012, you have web cameras almost at each polling station. So you can just go to the website of the Electoral Com Commission and see what's happening at pretty much any polling station, which gives it incredible uh, transparency, right? And a lot of um, NGOs monitoring the elections were using that in order to detect uh, possible fraud or violations of the electoral law. But it's interesting to say that uh, back in the 90s, uh, the first two parliamentary campaigns uh, taking place in the country were uh, over competitive, I would say, because there were hundreds of political parties. Those were mostly, well, all of them were brand new as uh, Russia had just switched to a different political regime at that point. Uh, now you have a system that is... Uh, 
um, quite stable and uh, you have less political parties, but still every electoral cycle would bring new either uh, political parties or other entities or uh, different candidates to the uh, arena. Uh, but what's important in uh, this particular um, election is that there are four new regions that joined the Russian Federation just recently, and uh, it's about uh, 10 million people joining in. So one of the biggest problems over there is the uh, voters' lists, right? Because uh, it's uh, those are areas where you still have ongoing battles. It's a war zone, pretty much. So that's why it's really hard to, uh, to trace uh, people. And sometimes when you have uh, uh, regional administrations or other governmental institutions that are supposed to keep track of the citizens, you cannot even find uh, documents uh, that you need because some of them just simply got uh, destroyed or uh, were intentionally uh, burned or whatsoever else as a result of the uh, conflict uh, ongoing in the area. So voters' lists uh, were uh, quite a big problem uh, during the uh, preparation process. And uh, another uh, problem is that um, electoral committee members uh, do not have the experience that we have here on the mainland, as we call it. And it means that in, uh, in a very fast way, they had to adapt uh, to the legislation, to the procedures that uh, are quite sophisticated on this side. Because uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the system itself was evolving because of the pressure. So after each election, there would be quite a lot of, uh, or there was quite a lot of criticism, which made the Central Electoral Commission change a lot of uh, procedural uh, procedures and rules, right? In order to make it more transparent, in order for um, er electoral observers to be able to control the process and so on. What, what, what's interesting, maybe you can comment on this, in, in this, uh, you kind of alluded to this before, in, in the war zones and in the, when you have hostilities, you have internally displaced persons. You also have a lot of um, potential absentee voters, i.e. people who have left the region to, you know, to have their families stay safe or stay with other members of the family in other parts of the Russian Federation. Um, so about organizing their ability to vote, um, is are there, are there uh, programs or do you have they have procedures for this because I I assume this is a big issue, uh, but your 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 comments on that? Absolutely. So the um, uh, the overall population of those four regions is about ten million uh, people. Of course, uh, uh, some of them are under eighteen. It means that they're not um, eligible as voters. Yet at the same time, the way they trace them at the moment is that. Um, uh, the ones willing were given uh, Russian passports. And so this is something that can easily be traced. Yet, uh, just like you mentioned, there are internally displaced uh, people. There are some people who are absent because after getting the passports, they uh, um, a lot of them moved to safer um, areas or just simply more comfortable ones. Uh, so it's not easy to trace them. Uh, and at the same time, you have quite a lot of people that uh, are normally based in other regions of the Russian Federation, but do their service uh, in uh, in those regions. So for them, the procedure is that uh, beforehand, uh, several days before the election, they need to come to the uh, closest uh, polling station where they intend to vote and they need to register as voters. So they need to um, um provide uh, valid uh, documents that uh, that show that they are um, normally based somewhere else and registration uh, in the Russian Federation is um, obligatory. So it's a stamp in your passport that you have uh, that basically uh, says where you live or where you mainly live. And depending on that, uh, you uh, choose your polling station. But some of the regions this year have joined a pilot program that implies that uh, an app that provides uh, state services or governmental services can be used uh, to vote online. So there are options for those people that are uh, citizens of the uh, Russian Federation based in other regions and uh, happen to find themselves in uh, the new regions, for instance, uh, during the election period. 
And uh, and also, Sonia, I know that you you've got um, a lot of experience uh, in doing election observations and monitoring in other countries. I know you've also done this work in Africa as well, and you probably have a lot of uh, let's say observations of being able to compare and contrast how things are done in different countries. Um, what are some of the things that um, that that you learned uh, from those experiences, and how can you uh, you know apply that to uh, let's say evaluating uh, the the success of the uh, the 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 ability to uh, provide access um, to voters uh, in what you're calling the new regions uh, in the Donbass and Crimea and so forth. Uh, what what are some of your thoughts about that having having been around to different parts of the world, um, looking at these processes? Um, well, um, I, I've tried probably all of the possible roles during the election. So um, just like I mentioned, I started uh, taking part in those back in 2006, so almost 20 years ago. And I was a part of, I was an electoral committee member. I was uh, a candidate uh, at municipal elections. Um, I was uh, representing um, representing the um, candidates' uh, headquarters, and I was working with different political parties, and uh, it, that's quite a lot of experience. So uh, what's interesting is that uh, one of the tendencies that can be observed is that um, at the moment you have uh, uh, smaller and smaller numbers of voters turnout, so people are less interested in the elections themselves and they're less uh, willing to participate and practice their um, rights. Um, so that's quite a problem because at the, uh, for instance, at the regional level of elections, you hardly ever see turnout that would be more than 40% if you talk about central Russia. Uh, there are some regions where uh, voters have maybe more discipline or responsibility and the numbers would be much higher. But uh, on the average, uh, at the federal level of elections, that would be around 50, 60, more than a bit more than 60%. And what it means is that there there can be more uh, manipulations and fraudulent activities because the less people you have at the polling station and the less ballots are used, uh, the more space for manipulation you can potentially have. So uh, some of the uh, oppositional forces, in, in uh, some cases, they call for boycott, uh, which doesn't really make sense if you look at it as a, a political technologist, right, or a person or a consultant, a person uh, who is, uh, you know, designing the uh, the rules of the game in order for them to be, um, you know, more or less objective. So um, that's one of the uh, problems: uh, people not willing to uh, to uh, practice their uh, their rights. Yet at the same time, the presidential election always scores top in terms of uh, uh, turnout. So that's the most interesting one for the uh, voters. Um, in most cases. And if you look at um, other countries, and I've been, uh, uh, well, all around Africa, in Zimbabwe, in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, in South Africa, uh, Madagascar, uh, Mozambique, uh, observing elections and interacting with electoral committees, and moreover, uh, Kyrgyzstan um, as well, and Armenia during the uh, referendum. So the rules uh, are uh, very different from country to country. But what is interesting uh, regarding the uh, African election is that um, instead of putting a tick uh, on the uh, ballot paper, in many cases they would uh, uh, they would use uh, their thumb and put like a fingerprint. Uh, of course, it's not that uh, <laughs> there is some expertise uh, taking place to make sure that uh, that's exactly the, uh, the 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 person uh, who was given the ballot. Uh, but uh, in any case, it uh, uh, it also implies some transparency. So it's it's uh, much more difficult to. Uh, you know, just put in uh, some of the uh, fraudulent ballots into the, um, you know, ballot boxes. Yet at the same time, elections are always uh, full of different kinds of situations and scandals. And sometimes it's like a sitcom uh, and there is no way you can avoid it because it's a moment of, you know, high pressure and tension. And of course, sometimes you have uh, different incidents happening and, uh, you know, up to fights between supporters of different political parties and this kind of things. 
in Africa as well, sometimes it gets com it gets complicated when, for instance, uh, electricity goes off and you need to finish counting with the candlelight or flashlight or this kind of things. And in DRC, for instance, on the election day when we observed the presidential election, uh, there was um, almost like a flooding rain, at least in the in the uh, capital city. And for that reason, uh, before the rain was over, uh, up until like lunchtime, uh, people weren't really able to make it to the polling stations. And that's why towards the end of the day, you had crazy queues consisting of hundreds of people. And so the electoral committees had to uh, they had to make a decision not to close at 8 p.m. as they were supposed to, but they allowed everyone who came before 8 p.m. to uh, vote, for instance. So also in, in some of the countries in um, Africa, aside for names of the uh, political parties or candidates or brief uh, descriptions, you can notice that um, the campaigning itself um, is uh, different. So there are more portraits and more of images. And they also use uh, that, uh, that kind of ballot papers with big uh, images instead of uh, text in order to provide additional opportunities for uh, people that are unable to read in, uh, let's say, the official languages. Because in Africa, um, sometimes you, you happen to see situations when people from uh, neighboring villages speak different languages, right? Uh, there are hundreds of languages in Africa. And uh, in rural areas, not everyone speaks, uh, let's say, English or French fluently or is able to read in English and French. So they speak their native languages. So that's another issue. And for that reason, even the way the ballot papers look uh, would be quite different. But uh, if you compare some of the African uh, procedures to the European ones, let's say you would find them uh, to be more transparent in many cases, because in Zimbabwe, for instance, after the counting is over, they put uh, the papers with all of the uh, final numbers on the door of the uh, polling station. So in the morning, you can pass by and you can take a look at all of the numbers and then compare them with the official data. And that is clearly uh, leaving much less space for various kinds of uh, manipulations. And moreover, um, in those uh, um, during those elections, when um, I was a part of observation missions, I happened to see that, uh, especially uh, not in the capital cities, but in, in uh, suburban areas and rural areas, people are very open and friendly. And the members uh, of the electoral committees are very open to observers. So they're willing to explain the uh, processes, the procedures, and to guide uh, observers uh, through the processes. So uh, that seemed, you know, to be quite open. Uh, and uh, I would say that you do not really see too many observer um, observers' missions uh, during African elections. So normally those would be some of the uh, regional um, African organizations uh, and sometimes uh, the European Union or other organizations would send um, observers um, uh, observers and observation missions. But normally that would be not more than 50 from 50 to 100 people per country, which definitely cannot really cover uh, all of the regions in an effective way. Well, I think a lot of people in, uh, well, I, I can tell you a true story in the United States in the 2020 presidential election, East swing state in Georgia, uh, a burst water pipe apparently flooded uh, uh, during the heat of counting between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. I think it was at 11 p.m. or something. They had to evacuate. They had to evacuate the uh, giant facility, uh, and then they stopped counting for many, many hours. And uh, all of a sudden, at 3 a.m., they s apparently began counting again. And and as if by magic, Joe Biden shot ahead of Donald Trump. Um, so I mean, if that magic. happened. If that happened in, in another country, they'd probably be screaming fraud, right? But in the United States, it's uh, you, you couldn't even talk about it or you'd get censored on social media at the time. I mean, it's, that's, a, that's a pretty extraordinary uh, situation. And I'm saying this because the, the United States is very critical of everybody else's elections uh, around the world. But I think we could probably do with uh, election, international election monitors uh, in the United States, actually, um, is a record low confidence right now in elections. And one of the reasons as well is an over-reliance on electronic 
technology. And just we got a couple minutes left. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, what have you observed on that issue of uh, a, a re a reliance on on electronic voting and how tr you know how transparent are the systems? Are there better methods than other? uh paper methods or hybrid methods your 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 thoughts on that before we break now uh, well i think that it's even easier to manipulate digital uh systems uh and uh, there were quite a lot of investigations on the uh, software being used in the united states or that was used in the united states uh, previously uh, it's just, you know, very easy to program the software in a way in which you would get the uh, result that you want, right? And there is no way you can double check it because when you have papers, you, you have to archive them and you can recount at least that, right? So it makes it a bit more difficult. Uh, yet at the same time, if that was based on blockchain technology that, that, that was open and, you know, transparent, at least for specialists to get in and see, uh, it could have guaranteed, um, you know, better results. But, uh, in the United States, for instance, the, uh, the electoral procedures and system is very closed. Uh, I mean, it, it's really hard to get there as an observer and there are almost none. And foreign observation or international observation is pretty much non-existent in the United States. Whereas, uh, for instance, in South Africa, if you are an NGO that uh, has that point uh, on on your statu statute, now you can easily apply. You just send the list, you send the documents uh, related to your um, organization, and you get accreditation and you can, you know, go and see. So I would say that that's an indicator number one. That if you have nothing to hide, why wouldn't you allow people just to, you know, come and observe? <laughs> What's the problem then? And in terms of uh, digital uh, technologies, now, of course, they simplify a lot, especially when you talk about voters lists and um you know, uh, uh, keeping track of the turnout. But when you talk about counting, uh, I think that software is much easier to to program. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Using big databases for voter rolls, um, that's one type. It's good that you separated those two things, and the other is the actual process of counting. That's where the real controversy uh, takes place. Although there's there's uh, accusations of uh, manipulation of voter rolls. Certainly, we've seen that in the United States uh, with the cross check. Uh, software uh, where there one party is striking people off the rolls, um, and another party might be using the same to to double count uh, as well. So yeah, I agree with you. Uh, the, with with digital technology comes a lot more issues uh, that sometimes aren't so transparent uh, as one would like. But um, that's a big issue going forward. And uh, I personally, I'm a, I'm a advocate for uh, old fashioned paper ballots. I, there's a lot of countries that do it and they manage to count it and announce the results on the same night. So it's not like it's impossible. Uh, some countries actually still do that. But as we become more reliant on technology in the US, they're now taking four or five weeks to count some states like Arizona did uh, in the midterm elections which is really crazy. So yeah, I'm a, I, I guess a Luddite in that respect, very old fashioned. I like paper ballots. One of the key accusations, if I'm not mistaken, was that uh, on those voter rolls, uh, you could find dead people. And when you have uh, paper uh, lists, uh, you can always see your neighbors and if they, you know, signed or not on those lists or your family members. And of course, it can pose questions if some of the uh, ones that are gone are appearing on the list, right? And when you use digital systems, even for voters' rolls, uh, there is less of opportunities to see at least that kind of fraud, the very obvious one when they just use data of people who are not even there anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also big student populations around universities. Students register when the first time voting, usually 17, 18 years old, and they stay on the local rolls. And those rolls can be, you know, those ballots could be harvested uh, potentially. This also happens a lot. Uh, certainly, I can talk about this in the United States. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of potential problems. But uh, yeah, we're going to break now. But uh, Yulia Berg, uh, we really want to thank you for for joining us on TNT this week and sharing your thoughts and your insights on this important issue. Thank you. 
And she goes, ladies and gentlemen, that is Yulia Berg from the Globus Expert Club. She's a political scientist. Really appreciate her insights on this. We'll be uh, talking more about this tomorrow uh, as well. We're going to bring in uh, some more people who are based uh, in this region, uh, in the Donbass, to discuss this. We'll get down to a lot more insights, a lot more detail, and also the political and geopolitical problems around the region and beyond. We'll be discussing those as well tomorrow. Let's take a break, however, and we'll connect with our research assistant for the show, Christian James, on the other side, to look at the budget fiasco in the UK and much, much more coming up in just a few minutes. Stay right there. <laughs> 